Would you take your Bibles and turn to the book of Acts tonight? <clears throat> Acts chapter 10, if you would. Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10 tonight. We're going to be looking at the story of one of my favorite Bible characters. I know I say that about almost all Bible characters, but truly this man is one of my favorites because I really, I kind of identify with him. And uh, back in uh, 2022, we began a study through the life of Peter and that carried us through really 20, the end of 22 and then through 23 and uh, was we looked then at First and Second Peter, and I and, uh, really enjoyed that study. The uh, Lord really blessed me in my time in the Word as we looked at his life. And it's the man, Peter, that we're going to be looking at tonight as kind of an illustration of what we talked about this morning, the issue of surrendering to the Lord. And I've entitled the sermon tonight, Peter's Journey of Surrender. Peter's Journey of Surrender. You know, if surrender were something that you only did one time and that was it, you never had to worry about it again, um, you would expect to see that happen in the Bible. That people would, you know, they would get surrendered to God one time and then from there on out they would never struggle, they would never have any problems, they would never falter, they would never fall. But you just don't see that happening. What you see in the Bible is you see people that follow the Lord and they make mistakes. And they have to backtrack. They have to fix things. And for a time, they'll go on, they'll do more, and maybe they'll make another mistake. They have to fix it again. I mean, think about every great Bible character that, that you know of. There's, there's only a very small number that there's not something explicitly sinful recorded about them. I mean, there just, there just isn't. And Peter is kind of the same way. And I want us to start here in Acts chapter 10. And um, we're going to read one verse of Scripture in just a minute, but let me set the context first. We're in the middle of the book of Acts, so the church has already begun. Uh, the day of Pentecost has come and gone. The church at Jerusalem has been established. Thousands and thousands of people were saved and added to that church Persecution came and the believers were scattered abroad. And so now there are people going everywhere preaching the gospel. But we're still very much in the kind of the formative stage of, of uh, the New Testament. Uh, the book of Acts is very transitional in nature, going from uh, the old way of doing things, if you want to put it that way, to the new way of doing things. And, and uh, so we find that in this particular chapter, there was still one major question that God had to make clear particularly to the Jewish people, and that is that salvation was for everybody, not just the Jews. The salvation was for Jews and Gentiles alike. And so God chose Peter to uh, give him a very special revelation in the form of a vision for the purpose of helping him and everyone else then understand that salvation was not for Jews exclusively, but it was for everybody. And so, as Peter one day is, uh, 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 the Bible says in verse 10, he became very hungry and he would have eaten. Uh, I can identify with that. But while they made ready, he fell into a trance. I can identify with that too sometimes. Waiting for supper, right? And if you think it's never going to get there, I'll die if I don't eat. Now, truth be told, I've never died from hunger yet. And so, verse 11, he saw heaven opened as he fell into this trance, and a certain vessel descending unto him, as it had been a great sheet knit at four corners and let down to the earth, wherein were all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth, and wild beasts, and creeping things, and fowls of the air. And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill, and eat. So in this vision... He sees the sheet being lowered from heaven and it's got all of these animals which according to the Old Testament law you weren't supposed to eat. They were considered to be unclean animals and therefore forbidden to be eaten under the Old Testament law. However, verse 13, he hears the voice of God in this vision, in this trance. He hears the voice of God saying, Peter, kill it and eat it. 
And I want you to notice his response in verse 4 in this vision. And Peter said, not so, Lord. You see those three words, not so, Lord. Maybe put a little parenthesis around those or circle them or underline them, underline them in your Bible. Because what you have in those three words is a direct contradiction. As we saw this morning, to call someone your Lord is to say that they're your master, they're your ruler, they are in charge of you. And therefore, what they say goes. Whatever they tell you to do, you ought to do it. Now, Peter, in this vision, hears the voice of God telling him to do something, and what does Peter say? No. Now, this is repeated a total of three times in this vision before the vision ends, and Peter kind of comes to, and he's like, what did I just see? What just happened to me? And while he was thinking on it, these men that God had sent to him to hear the gospel knock on the door, and he goes down and he finds out that it's a group of Gentiles that God had sent to him to preach the gospel to them so that they might be saved. And Peter finally connected the dots between the vision and the salvation of the Gentiles. That what God was saying with that sheet and full of unclean animals is that there's no longer a division between clean and unclean, Gentile and Jew, that that's been broken down in Christ. And the Gentiles are also supposed to receive the gospel so that they might be saved. But I find it curious that after all these years, literally, of the Lord Jesus Christ working with Peter and all of his stubbornness and all of his sometimes loud mouthedness, that Peter still has this remnant of rebellion. This, this, this remnant of a hesitancy to surrender. Because God said, do this, and he said, not so. And what I want to do tonight is kind of very quickly go through the story of Peter to see how that over time God had to teach him what surrender really was all about. He had to learn over time what the life of surrender looked like. And throughout that, that time that he was learning and really throughout his life, he experienced the peaks and the valleys. He experienced the literal mountain peaks when he was on the Mount of Transfiguration and saw Jesus changed before his very eyes. He also experienced the literal low points when he was walking on the water to Jesus, but he took his eyes off of Christ and watched the storm instead, and he began to sink. Peter went through the whole ups and downs of the process, but Christ never gave up on Peter, just like Christ will never give up on you tonight. I want to encourage you tonight that a life of surrender is really a journey. Every time Peter messed up, Jesus was there to walk him through the recovery process. And every time you mess up, and then you go back on your commitment to surrender, God, the Lord Jesus Christ, will be there for you too. Heavenly Father, bless our time in your word. Encourage us that we would live daily a life of surrender to Christ. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's go to Matthew chapter 4, if you would. Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4. And we're going to notice, first of all, Peter's start. How did Peter get start, started on the journey of surrender? Well, it came in answer to the call of the Lord Jesus Christ. Matthew chapter 4 verse 18 says, And Jesus, walking by the sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And he saith unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And they straightway left their nets and followed him. This is how Peter's journey to surrender began. It began at a moment in time when he answered the call of the Lord Jesus Christ to forsake his fishing 
for fish and follow Jesus and let Jesus make him into a fisher of men. There came a point where Peter had to make a choice. Am I going to keep doing what I've been doing, living for myself, making money, taking care of my family as I have been? Or am I going to obey this person, the Lord Jesus Christ? And that day, the Bible says that Peter forsook his nets to follow Jesus. And that was the beginning of his journey. Jesus was calling Peter to leave that life of fishing for fish to become a, 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 a to lead a life of fishing for men. His occupation was going to be to go find lost souls and preach the gospel to them so that they might be saved. Now up until a certain point, Peter had followed Jesus kind of part-time, but now it was time for him to forsake all and follow Jesus full-time. In Luke's account, we read that when they had brought their ships to land, they forsook all and followed Him. Understand that that is what surrender is. It's forsaking all to follow Jesus. Both components are involved. If there's any part in your life that you're staying, still hanging on to selfishly, your desire, your dream, this is what you want, you'll give God every other part, but I've still got this little thing over here. If you're not forsaking all, then you're not fully surrendered. And if you're not truly following Jesus, if you're kind of going your own way, it's kind of Jesus-ish way, but it's not Jesus' way fully, then you're not fully surrendered yet. Full surrender comes when you forsake all to follow Christ. You cannot be a part-time follower of Jesus and succeed in the Christian life. You can't. You can't be a cultural Christian and be what God wants you to be and do what God wants you to do. We have a lot of cultural Christians, especially where we live here in the South. You ask people, are you a Christian? Oh yeah, I'm a Christian. Well, how do you know you're a Christian? Well, I go to church. Well, I didn't ask if you went to church. I asked if you're a Christian. How do you know you're a Christian? Well, I, my mama and daddy were Christians. Well, I'm glad, but... And there's this idea that some people have that, that you're a Christian simply because of the kind of family you grew up in or because of the kind of church you choose to associate with, when being a Christian actually means being a follower and an imitator of the Lord Jesus Christ. But there are a lot of people, they're just cultural Christians. They're just Christians in name only. They'll go to church most Sundays or some Sundays or an occasional Sunday, ever the case may be, but they are not committed to Christ. They're living their life how they want to live. They're doing what they want to do. They're living to please themselves. That kind of a life only ends in frustration and dissatisfaction. Peace, joy, and fulfillment only comes by following Christ fully. Mark 8, 34 Jesus said when He had called the people unto Him with His disciples also, He said unto them, Whosoever will come after Me, let him deny himself, and take up his cross, and follow Me. We looked at that idea this morning of taking up the cross. What does that mean? It means death to self. It means denying yourself what you want so that you can do what God wants. You must follow Christ and obey God's calling. Notice how in Matthew chapter 4 here. Look at verse 19. Jesus said to Peter, He saith unto him, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. You know, God's calling is first to Himself and then to the work that He has us to do. It's so important that we remember that. Because we get so wrapped up in what to do, the actions, the, the uh, occupation, if you will, that we lose sight of the one who has called us to himself. Jesus said, follow me, Peter, and I will make you. And that's what you see in Peter's life. That's what we're going to see tonight, is how Christ made him into what Christ wanted him to be, a fisher of men. But the surrender was first and foremost to Christ, to follow him. You know, sometimes 
young people are, are struggle with surrender to God because they think, well, if I surrender to God, you know, he's going to call me to be a missionary in some village somewhere and I'm going to have to live in a mud hut and I'm going to have to eat, you know, bugs and guts and yucky stuff. And they struggle then to surrender. They think, well, if I surrender, you know, that's what I'm saying I'm going to do. Well, no, you're not saying that's definitely what you're going to do. Let me help everybody out tonight. When we talk about surrender, it is first and foremost surrender to God. It's to follow Him. And as you follow Him, then He'll direct your path where He wants you to go. And you know what you'll find? If you are following Him and the path then that He leads you on you will be happier there than you would have ever been anywhere else. For some, it does mean living in a mud hut and eating bugs and guts and all kinds of yucky stuff. And you know what? You know what they'll tell you? If they're truly serving God and they're surrendered, they'll tell you, I'd rather be here than anywhere else. Because a life of surrender is a life of happiness and joy and fulfillment. God calls us to Himself first. Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Our responsibility is to simply surrender to Christ and let Christ do the work in us and through us. Let Him make us what He wants us to be. This is Peter's start. He forsook all to follow Christ. That's a good start. And that's where we all need to start. We need to forsake all and follow Christ as well. But you know, Peter's road was kind of rocky. You know, he made some mistakes along the way. He messed up quite a few times. And he, he was the kind of guy that he spoke his mind. And as Proverbs says, a fool uttereth all his mind. Sometimes he said things when he shouldn't have. So I want you to notice with me, secondly, Peter struggles. I want to just highlight a few times that Peter, he messed up. He messed up. So turn over to Matthew chapter 14. Matthew chapter 14. In this passage, we have the story of Jesus walking on water, but not only Jesus, also Peter. Matthew 14, verse 26. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled. So they remember they were out in this boat and a storm comes up, and in the middle of the storm they see Jesus walking on the water, but they didn't know it was Jesus. They were troubled, saying, It is a spirit, and they cried out for fear. Verse 27, But straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. And he said, Come. And Peter, when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? And I love this story for so many reasons. It's great for Sunday school and children's church to illustrate, uh, you know, fun to talk about. But there's some things about Peter that I love in this story. Now, we know this story so well that it can kind of lose its impact on us. But can you imagine actually being out in a boat in the middle of this big sea? You can't see shore on either side because it's dark and because it's so far away. This big storm comes up and you're legitimately afraid you're going to drown. It's going to sink your boat. And in the middle of this storm, you look out through the dimness of the night, but you clearly can distinguish someone walking on top of the water. Now we hear that, we're like, well, yeah, that's what Jesus did. He walked on the water. But no, 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 no. Never in recorded history had that happened before. Okay? They're seeing this for the first time. And we know they were afraid because it says they said they were troubled and they said, it's a spirit, it's a ghost. They were frightened. They were scared out of their mind. Can you imagine being there? But Peter, knowing, or Jesus rather, knowing their fear, he cries out and he says, it's me. It's okay. It's all right. It's just Jesus walking on the water. 
wait, wait. It's just me, be, calm down. You're walking on water, Jesus, and you're like, oh, don't worry about it, it's just me. <laughs> well, Peter was not quite sure. So he said, if it's you, bid me come unto thee. And Jesus said, come, come. Now don't miss this. Of all of the disciples that were on that boat, who was the one that had enough courage and enough faith to step over the side of the boat down onto the water? Peter. We applaud him for that. Good for you, Peter. He had enough faith to do that. And he began to walk on the water. He became the second person in recorded history to actually walk on water. But it didn't last very long. And here's where his failure came in. The Bible says that after just some moments of walking on the water, he began to look around at the wind and the waves, and he became afraid. He took his eyes off of Jesus. He started out walking by faith. He started out following the voice of the Lord Jesus Christ. But he got his eyes off of Jesus. He began to look at the problem. He began to look at the storm. And he became afraid. And as soon as his faith turned to fear, the Bible says he began to sink. And as he's sinking down in fear, he cries out to Jesus, Lord, save me. You know, that's not exactly a very eloquent prayer, you know. I'm so glad we don't have to be eloquent prayers in order for God to hear us. He just said, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and pulled him up. Peter was falling, but Jesus caught him. And then Jesus gave him these words of rebuke. He said, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? Peter was the only one that had enough faith to get out of the boat in the first place. But Jesus said he was of little faith. Why? Because he took his eyes off of Jesus and began to fear instead of continuing to walk in faith. You know what? Peter had to learn over time how to live consistently by faith. There were times like this and others that we'll see where he didn't do so good of a job. But I'm so thankful that in every time Jesus was there, every time Jesus was there to pick him back up, every time Jesus was there to help him recover, Jesus never gave up on Peter. Even when he had to say to Peter, you have, a, you have little faith. You're doubting me. Jesus, so gracious and so merciful, kept Peter from falling beneath the waves, kept Peter from drowning, put him back safely on the boat, took him to the shore. Don't doubt Jesus. Have faith. Now let's look in Matthew chapter 16 at another time where Peter, he messed up, all right? There's no other way to put it. He messed up. Matthew 16, look at verse 23. It says, From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go into Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Verse 22, Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. But he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan, for thou art an offense unto me, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. You know, Peter was the most rebuked of all the apostles. Here it is again. Peter is hearing Jesus explain to them all of these things that are going to be happening to him, how that he's going to be crucified and beaten and, and all of these things. And, and Jesus is just trying to prepare them for what's coming because it's going to be hard for them. You can imagine how hard it would be for you to watch your good friend and teacher to be arrested, beaten, and executed. That would be pretty rough. And so Jesus is just trying to prepare them for this and telling them this is what's going to happen. And there came a point where Peter, for whatever reason, 
just decided he had enough of this and he was going to set Jesus straight. Can you imagine that? Thinking that you're going to set the Son of God straight. And so he says to the Lord Jesus, Far be it from thee, Lord. Verse 22, This shall not be unto thee. Now there's two problems in what Peter's doing here. First of all, Peter has pride in his heart. Who does he think he is to be reprimanding the Lord Jesus Christ? Who does he think he is to be challenging and contradicting Jesus? So there's, a, there's an element of pride here. It's like, Peter, buddy, <laughs> you need to get back in your place, man. If Jesus said it, that's it. That's settled. There's no discussion. He's not, he's not bringing it up for a vote here, okay? <laughs> he's just telling you this is what's going to happen. But then there's this contradictory, rebellious spirit in Peter that's cropping up again. Because Jesus said one thing and Peter's like, nah, not going to be like that. He'd do the same thing in just a little while later when Jesus said, all of you are going to deny me. And what does Peter say? Oh, everybody else will deny you, but not me. Not going to do it. There was this rebellion still in Peter's heart. Listen. We all still struggle with that from time to time. I'm looking out here tonight. I don't see a single halo on anybody. Some of you are pretty close. But I, there's not anyone here that's perfect yet. We all struggle sometimes with rebellion. God says to do one thing, and we don't really want to. God says, children, obey your parents in the Lord. Yeah, but I don't want to take out the trash right now. Doesn't matter. God says obey your parents. God says be kind one to another, tender hearted and forgiving one another. But you know what? That person really hurt us. I don't really feel like forgiving them right now. I kind of want to hold on to this grudge for a little bit. I want to nurse this wound a little bit. Doesn't matter. God says be kind and forgive. You need to be kind and forgive. We all struggle with rebellion from some... It's, from time to time. And that's what Peter's doing here. And so Jesus turns to him and, and some of the strongest words of rebuke in all of Scripture. He looks at Peter. Get this. He looks at Peter and he says, Get thee behind me, Satan. Was Jesus calling Peter Satan? No. What he was doing was he was pointing out that what Peter was saying and what Peter was doing were the words and the works of Satan. In other words, while Peter said it, it was the devil behind it. A temptation, I believe, is what's going on there to discourage Christ, to try and get him to not go through with the plan of salvation. And he looks at him and says, Get thee behind me, Satan. He says, Thou savorest not those things which be of God, but those which be of men. You do not delight in the things of God. You just want what you want. That's what he's saying, essentially. Wow, that's pretty strong. But wait, this is Peter, right? This is the guy who's going to preach on the day of Pentecost, and 3,000 people are going to be saved. This is the guy who walked on water. This is the guy who, in the garden, pulled out the sword and cut off the guy's ear. Yeah, same guy who here is arguing with Jesus, and Jesus has to say, Get thee behind me, Satan. Peter struggled. Let me show you one more instance, probably the most infamous, and that's in Matthew 26, the night before Jesus was crucified. When Peter betrayed the Lord Jesus Christ three times. Matthew 26, verse 30. When they had sung in him, they went out into the Mount of Olives. Then saith Jesus unto them, All ye shall be offended because of me this night. For it is written, I will smite the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered abroad. But after I am risen again, I will go before you into Galilee. Peter answered and said unto him, Though all men shall be offended because of thee, yet will I never be offended. Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, that this night before the cock crow thou shalt deny me thrice. Peter said unto him, Though I should die with thee, yet will I not deny thee. 
Likewise, also said all the disciples. This is right after that last supper and Jesus tells his disciples, tonight all of you are going to be offended. And there's Peter again, always saying something when he should have kept his mouth shut. He said, nope, not me. I'll never deny you. Even if everybody else does, I will not. You see, Peter thought for sure that he wouldn't fall, which is why he did. Let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. Pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Peter was just certain that he would never do that, even if it meant dying with Christ. But we go down to verse 69. And we read how Peter sat without in the palace and a damsel came unto him saying, Thou also wast with Jesus of Galilee. But he denied before them all, saying, I know not what thou sayest. And three separate occasions that night, Peter was given the opportunity to stand up and identify with Jesus. And three times Peter said, I don't know him. And each time it got progressively worse. Till the end he's cursing and denying that he's ever known Jesus. The Bible says that in the book of Luke, when he, la- when he denied Christ for the third time, that the Lord turned and looked upon Peter, and Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he said unto him, Before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. And Peter went out and wept bitterly. I think that was the low point for Peter right there. I think right then he felt like he was lower than the dirt, you know. He knew he had sinned. He was genuinely sorry for it, but sorry doesn't change it. He'd done it, right? What now? Maybe he's thinking, I've blown it. I'm, there, I'm not coming back from this. This is it. Done. I'm sure God can forgive me, but there's no way God's ever going to use me again. We don't know exactly what was going through Peter's heart. We can speculate based on the indications of Scripture. But you know, at the heart of all these struggles that we've seen really illustrate the struggles that we all have in this area of surrender. In every single one of them, there was a common thread. And that is the struggle to believe and obey God's Word. Not so, Lord, far be it from thee, I will never deny thee. And looking around at the waves instead of looking at Jesus, that's all doubt, unbelief, lack of faith, and lack of obedience to the Word of God. That's the struggle. That's the struggle for surrender right there. Not accept what God says as absolutely true and live according to it. Wanting to believe something a little different or wanting to put your own spin on it. Wanting to put in your two cents. Yeah, but what about this kind of a thing? Wanting to correct Jesus and set Him straight to get Jesus to see reality as Peter defined it. Well, I know that's what God says, but here's what it means, I think. That's all symptomatic of a lack of surrender. And don't we often do the same thing with God's Word. We read what God says, we hear what God says in preaching and teaching, and instead of just believing it to be true and obeying it, we put our spin on it. Well, yes, I I know that it says this, but it must mean something else. Or, or, yeah, but it doesn't really apply here because this is different. That's a lack of faith and a lack of surrender. But I don't want to end here with his struggles. I want to go on to Peter's success. Peter's success. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 5. If we were to end in Matthew 26, what a disappointment Peter's story would be. He'd be another Judas. But it didn't end there. This same man who denied Christ three times would go on to be used of God in a great way, including writing two books that are in our Bibles, 1 and 2 Peter. And I want you to read what Peter wrote 
In 1 Peter 5, verses 5 through 6. Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that He may exalt you in due time. Where did Peter learn that truth? God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. In the school of hard knocks. He learned it by experience. He knew this to be true because he had been the proud one who said, I'll never deny Christ, and he fell. And he had to humble himself. And when he did, God exalted him. How did Peter go from being the denier of Christ to being the writer of such wonderful truths as this that he could say with all sincerity that God will exalt you in due time? The answer is because Jesus never gave up on him. Now see, that's kind of backwards to our thinking. And a lot of times when you hear people, even in, in uh, sermons and everything, talking about how to succeed in life and how to do better at this and how to improve in that, they're going to tell you, let me give you the seven steps to succeed in life. And, and they'll tell you, you do this and you do this and you do this and you do that and, and you'll be a success. And a lot of preaching and teaching of the Bible is nothing more than religious self-help like that. And let me just tell you, it's worthless. The reason Peter succeeded was not because Peter figured out the seven steps that he must take to success. The reason that Peter succeeded is because Jesus never gave up on him. And when Peter finally got to the point that he said... Okay, Lord, whatever you say, I'll do it. That is when God began to do great things through Peter's life. It happened in John chapter 21. For sake of time, we won't look there, but you probably know the story. In John chapter 21, Peter says, I go a fishing. I think he was still just wrestling in his mind with whether or not God was ever going to be able to use him again. And he was going back to the only life that he knew he could succeed at based on past history. So he goes back to fishing and they're fishing all night and they catch nothing. They've had that experience before. So they're tired, they're exhausted, day breaks, they're getting ready to pack it up and be done and they look up on shore and there is someone cooking breakfast. And he hollers out and says, cast your nets on the right side. And so they throw their nets over and the Bible says they enclosed so much fish that the boats were going to sink, the nets were going to break. And so in the middle of all this, Peter realizes, that's Jesus. The Bible says he jumped out of the boat and he swam to shore because he couldn't wait to see Jesus. And in John 21, Jesus had a little fellowship with his disciples over breakfast of fish. And then he had a conversation with Peter. Peter, lovest thou me more than these? And Peter said, Lord, you know I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. Three different times Jesus asked a similar question. Three different times Peter kind of hedged in his answer. Yeah, Lord, I kind of, yeah, yeah, I mean, you know I like you. You know I'm fond of you. And three different times, Jesus gave Peter an assignment. Feed my sheep, feed my sheep, feed my lambs. And finally, Peter turns to Jesus. He or, turns, turns to Jesus and he says, what about this man? He points to John. What about this man? What's he going to do? And Jesus said, if I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? And then Jesus uttered these words to Peter again. He said, follow thou me. Think about that. That's how Peter's journey started, wasn't it? When Jesus said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. 
And now, after all of this failure on Peter's part, Jesus gives him the same invitation. Peter, I've still got work for you. Peter, I'm not done with you. Your life isn't over. over. Your failure is not final. Peter, follow thou me. And you know what? That's exactly what Peter did. He followed the Lord Jesus Christ. Was he perfect? Nah. He still made some mistakes even after that. Reading the book of Galatians about the problem he caused in the church there when he separated from the Gentiles when his Jewish buddies came up from Jerusalem. And the apostle Paul had to confront him. No, he wasn't perfect. But you know what? Through his journey of surrender, Peter learned more and more that if he would just humble himself under the mighty hand of God, that God would exalt him. That failure doesn't have to be final. You can recover by God's grace. You can surrender the things that you've taken back from God. You can enjoy a life of victory over sin and a life of joy and peace and fulfillment. If you will humble yourself and surrender to God, God will give you the grace that you need.